Good evening. Uh, my name is Martins Paparinskis, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you tonight as the chair of the seminar on the past, present, and future of the global legal order. So a small compact topic, just precisely for one hour's discussion. Indeed, if there's one thing we can be certain about the future of the global order, that it has an Oxford comma in it, and that I think is a, a pleasant sense of certainty. My role as a chair is a limited one. I will introduce the speaker, to which I will get in a second, and then I will organize the Q&A session after the talk. You may be familiar with the way how we do it at UCL. You should be able to ask the questions via the Q&A box. Please put it there, and then I will deliver the questions during the Q&A session. The speaker tonight is Professor Una Hathaway, who is a professor of international law at Yale Law School. She's not only an eminent academic with a great list of illustrious publications of her name, but also has a good sense of the way how international law works in that odd place, the real world. She uh, has been a member of the Advisory Committee of International Law at State Department for the last 15 years. And in 2014 and 15, she took leave to serve as special counsel to the General Counsel at the US Department of Defense. Her talk today uh, builds on her much reviewed and much discussed uh, co authored book, The Internationalists. See, I have it in my office as well and will bring the argument to the present times. And I think we're probably all uh, looking forward with great interest to hearing what she has to say about the future. Professor Hathaway, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you all. Uh, so um, I am planning on spending the first uh, bit of my talk sort of giving an overview of the argument um, that my co-author Scott Shapiro and I make in our book, The Internationalists, which is really about the history of the global order, sort of what the world used to look like, how it changed in the interwar period, um, and then what new um, global order that gave rise to. And then I wanna switch gears and talk about sort of where are we now and where are we headed? Um, and a bit of a focus on the recent events in the US, the, the um, election um, of President-elect Joe Biden and what impact um, perhaps that might have on the direction of the global order. And I'm certainly eager to have your questions, so please do put those in the Q&A box um, and we'll, I'll look forward to addressing those at the end. So I wanna share um, my screen so you all can see uh, my slides. Hopefully that will be helpful to you. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, this is the US cover of the book. Um, uh, what uh, Martins was holding up was the UK cover. Um, very, the, the, there's a lot to be said about the difference in the images um, uh, and the subtitles um, in particular. Um, but what I want to talk about today is I want to give an overview of the argument. So, the, the book begins by explaining what the old world order looked like, sort of what was the world like for hundreds of years. Then it makes an argument about transformation in the global legal order um, in the um, interwar period and the new world order that that gave rise to. And then, as I mentioned, as part of that discussion of the new world order, I want to talk about where are we now? Are we in the midst of possibly a new transformation? Um, where, where does it seem we might be headed? Um, and there it's really just suggestive because, of course, no one knows the future, um, but, but um, we have some hints. So first, the old world order, sort of taking us back several hundred years to um, what the world used to look like. Um, so uh, the book um, starts with um, a, a event um, that took place in the early 1600s. Um, Jacob van Heemskerk, this great Dutch explorer, seizes the Portuguese ship, the Santa Canarita, tows it all the way back to the Netherlands, sells it off um, at huge profit for himself and for the uh, Dutch East India Company that he works for. And um, they make an immense amount of money because this, this ship, which was found in the East Indies, is filled with all the riches of, um, of the East Indies, spices and silks and all kinds of other wonderful things. 
Um, they made an immense amount of money off of this. And as the captain of the ships that, um, that sees the Santa Canarina, he himself got 1% of the value of, this, of, the, of the sale, which was a huge amount of money. Um, but um, his uh, bosses realized that they had a bit of a problem, which is why was he allowed to do this? Why was he allowed to seize the Canary, Santa Canarina and sell it? Um, and were they actually able to keep their profits? Um, they had stockholders who were a little uncomfortable with this model. Why wasn't he just a pirate? And so they hired a young man by the name of Hugo Grotius. And if you're an international lawyer, you've almost certainly heard this name, otherwise you may not have, but he's often referred to as the father of international law. At the time, he wasn't yet the father of international law. He was sort of a young upstart. He was actually quite young um, at the time that he was hired. And he was hired to defend, to write a, basically to write a pamphlet defending the seizure of the Santa Canarina. And he had a personal investment in it because Jacob and Heemskirk happened to have been his cousin. So he both was hired by uh, the Dutch East India Company to write this and he was concerned about defending his cousin. He set out to write this, this, what was supposed to be a very brief defense, but in good academic form, he ended up writing something much too long. It took way too long. Um, and what he ended up doing was effectively rewriting the rules of the international order. Um, and the first draft of this, which was never formally published, became the sort of beginnings of his very famous work, still read today, The Law of War and Peace. Um, and in that book, if you actually sit down and read it, um, which very few people these do, days actually do, he formulates a theory of war where war is a permissible remedy for wrongdoing. He says, when judicial settlement ends, war begins. Now, how that applied to the Santa Catarina was that the Portuguese, to whom that ship had belonged, had been interfering with Dutch trade, um, the ability for them to buy um, spices in the area. They had had a monopoly over, tri uh, over trade with the Spice Islands um, and were really unhappy when the Dutch showed up. So they harassed um, locals who were willing to sell to the Dutch. They actually had seized some Dutch ships. They had tortured um, some of Heems Kirk's former um, shipmates. Um, when they caught them um, doing business in the area. And so that was, that was a wrongdoing for which the act of war, that is the seizing of the Santa Catarina, was a legitimate um, response in the view of Hugo Grotius. So you are, he articulates this view of war as a way of settling disputes, as a permissible remedy for wrongdoing between states in instances where those states can't go to court, which is generally they generally can never go to court, um, uh, certainly not if they're uh, engaged in a dispute um, far away from, from their home countries. And he says the subject matter is the same in warfare as in judicial trials. So basically any harm that's done to you that in the ordinary course you would be able to sue for, you can go to war for. So war is a legitimate means of resolving disputes between states, even sort of ordinary disputes that today we would think of as not the sorts of disputes that would give a right to go to war. In a, it, it, we briefly talk about this in the book, but we wrote a separate article on war manifestos. Um, and war manifestos are these documents that states issued for hundreds of years where they laid out their reasons for going to war. And what we see here is that states actually gave these reasons for going to war that today would seem not legitimate. So interference with trade relations was a reason that they would often give in their war manifestos. A tortious violation, you broke my ship and you failed to pay for it. Treaty violation was a pretty common reason for going to war. We had a treaty, you broke it, now I'm going to war with you. Um, suppression of religious affiliates, um, humanitarian. So sometimes they're savages and they're engaging in various violations of natural law. And so we're going to save them from themselves. Um, diplomacy, um, that is violations of diplomatic um, immunity and other kinds of protections, et cetera. So you can see this list here. So there's an immense number of reasons that states would go to war and that not just sort of, you know, they would be going to war for, for they would say that they were acting in self-defense, but these were their sort of hidden reasons. Self-defense certainly was one reason that they would go to war, but they would also claim these other reasons because those were harms that were considered legitimate reasons for going to war for, again, for hundreds of years. And if you're curious, if there are students on this webinar, um, we have a collection of all of these war manifestos. Just Google my name and war manifestos and you'll find the war manifestos database. You can actually read them. If you can read, 
Latin and Fractor, um, <laughs> and uh, in a couple of cases, classical Chinese. Um, uh, so they're they're not always easy to read, but um, they're also annotated. Um, so in the old world order, um, there is at this core, the privilege to use force, which Grotius articulated. And what I'm gonna show you is that the rest of the key rules of the system really rely on, depend on that central rule, that is the privilege to use force. Um, that all the other rules necessarily follow from it. And that those rules that um, held for hundreds of years depended on that core idea that states could go to war to right wrongs. So if war is legal, conquest is legal. One example that we give in the book, and there are many possible examples, but this is just one story that we tell. This is uh, President James Polk, um, who waged war against Mexico and seized a significant portion of Mexican territory um, in, in the course of that war and the treaty between the US and Mexico that um, ended the war ceded all of this territory to the United States. What was the justification for that war? The primary legal justification for that war was that Mexico actually owed money to the United States. So there had been a series of um, claims made against Mexico by US citizens and by the US itself. There had been a arbitral panel um, overseen by the King of Prussia, if memory serves, um, that had found that about 20 million of these claims were legitimate claims um, and that Mexico needed to pay. They came up with a system of quarterly payments for the Mexican government to pay the United States and Mexico failed to pay. Um, uh, Polk uh, made offers of we'll trade you some land in exchange. The Mexican government refused to even um, entertain the possibility and the US went to war. Um, and at the end, the treaty um, ceded all this land in compensation for the money owed to the United States and the cost of collection that is the war itself. Um, so to recompense the US uh, for the war and for the money that was owed, the US took this land. It realized it took a little more than it was entitled to. So it also gave Mexico, I think it was um, several million dollars in recompense for the additional land that it had taken. But the basic idea is that no one thought that this was unusual at the time. Conquest was perfectly legal and legitimate. If war is legal as a remedy for a wrong, that is the failure here to pay a debt, then conquest is legal because you can take that land and recompense for the harm that was done. Now, if war is legal, then gunpoint diplomacy is also legal. Um, here's another, again, there are hundreds of probably thousands of examples one could give, but one that we talk about in the book is uh, Commodore Matthew Perry, shows up in the harbor of Edo. He was himself fresh off of the US-Mexico war. Um, and um, he's been sent by Congress to insist that Japan open up to trade with the United States. At the time, Japan had been closed to trade with any country other than very, very limited occasional trade, roughly once a year with China. And there was a very limited amount of trade as well with the Dutch, but otherwise it was almost effectively completely cut off from the rest of the world. And the United States decided that it wanted to have a treaty of friendship and commerce with Japan so that it would have a waypoint into Asia that didn't depend on the UK controlled Hong Kong, which was its current um, central base in the region. Um, and so it sent a steamship. This is a wood cutting uh, drawing by someone who saw that um, show up. They hadn't seen any steamships up to that point. So this was really pretty terrifying sight. And he basically insisted, sign this treaty of friendship or else. And it was very clear that the alternative to a treaty of friendship was war. Um, and that was at the time legal and legitimate. Moreover, once that treaty was signed, which it was after a very long internal process where they tried to resist it, but failed, um, violations of that treaty would itself be a cause of war. So it really puts countries into quite a box. And again, that was at the time considered perfectly legal. A treaty brought about at, by literally gunboat diplomacy was considered perfectly legal and legitimate under the old world order. Um, if war is legal, then there can be no crime of aggression. So one example of this is after World War I, the allies attempted to try Kaiser Wilhelm II and the Dutch just refused to turn him over. The Dutch who now are the home of most of the international criminal tribunals um, said that, look, a war of aggression is not against the law. There's nothing illegal about waging a war of aggression. There's nothing criminal that he's done. Yes, it was a terrible thing, but it wasn't a criminal act. And so we're not going to turn him in to be over to be tried 
If war is legal, then there is no such thing as a crime of aggression. And if war is legal, states can't favor either side. Neutrals have to be perfectly neutral. Um, this is illustrated in Woodrow Wilson's speech in 1914 before the United States enters World War I, where he says the United States must be neutral in fact as well as in name, um, that it had to be entirely impartial. It had to be impartial even in thought and sentiments. Um, of course, he doesn't mean that literally, but neutrality at the time meant you could not favor either side and you certainly couldn't put in place economic sanctions against the belligerent in a war because if you did so, that was tantamount to waging war against them. And that, was, uh, that would involve you uh, in the war. You wouldn't have to fire a single shot. You would be considered to have entered the war against the state that you were sanctioning. So under the old world order, just to sum up, and in the book, this takes us quite a lot longer than I've get, given here. So if you're curious to get the details, you should take a look at that. But the privilege to use force is at the core of the old world order and all the rest of these rules, the right of conquest, the license to kill, that is a, the absence of a crime of aggression, neutrality requiring perfect impartiality and gunboat diplomacy necessarily follow from that. So how did that change? Because hopefully you're thinking this doesn't sound very familiar. This is not the world that we live in. You recognize that this is that this is quite different from, from the world that we um, have come to experience over the last 70 years or so. Um, we argue that that um, idea um, begins to change with, um, with anti-war activists, among them a um, lawyer, Sam and Levinson, who is just a regular guy in a way, um, a bankruptcy lawyer in Chicago. And he gets this outlandish idea about out outlawing war. He argues that we shouldn't have laws of war, but laws against war, um, just as there are no laws of murder, of poisoning, but laws against them. He starts an NGO a non-governmental organization that organizes all around the world. He works with American politicians. He really works hard to try and spread this idea. He, together with many others, and again, the book, uh, this is a truncated version of the story. Um, there are a number of other figures, including James Thomas Shotwell, who's sort of his um, competitor, um, who, uh, who is also advocating this idea of outlawing war. Um, and is partially responsible for bringing the idea to France and suggesting it to Briand, who then suggests it back to uh, Frank Kellogg, the Secretary of State, um, who then suggests internationalizing it. So the initial proposal was for it to just be a bilateral agreement between France and the US, and the US to try to kill it, um, suggests opening it up to everyone. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, Briand agrees to that. And that leads to the Calabrian Pact in 1928. That um, is, if you've heard of it, you've probably heard of it sort of in a joking way. This is the absurdity of international law. The idea that we could outlaw war is completely outrageous. The thought that outlawing war could be effective was just a kind of ridiculous idea of, um, of pacifists. But it was the most ratified treaty of the time um, in 1928, it was, this was a signing ceremony that was held in Paris, it was a very illustrious occasion. Then the treaty, so the initial 15 countries signed there, and then the treaty traveled the world and was um, ratified by nearly every country in the world at the time. It was a very simple um, uh, declaration in the treaty, which is states would no longer use war as an instrument of national policy. Now, from the modern perspective, that seems totally unremarkable, but if you understand this history, if you understand that for hundreds of years, uh, war was a central tool of national policy, that is of achieving um, your aims and working with other states of, of righting wrongs, that begins to look a little bit more interesting and a little bit more important. And the argument, the kind of counterintuitive argument that we make in the book um, is that that ends up being really important for setting the stage for the new world order that we live in. But it doesn't work right away. It, 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 it's certainly not the case that the act of signing the treaty in any sense solved the problem immediately. There were many bumps along the road and it takes them about 20 years to work out all the rules of the system because they don't fully understand how central the rule permitting war is to the global order of the time. And they don't fully appreciate, I think, and that we argue the ways in which um, the norm of permission to use force 
is central to the global order that has existed for hundreds of years, and they haven't really thought through what the rules are that are going to replace that. So the old world order, as I said, had privilege use force at its core. You yank that away, the rest of it falls apart, but it's not really clear what's going to appear in its place. And what ends up happening is that they replace the prohibition on force, the, the permission to use force with a prohibition on force. And it requires every one of the rest of the rules to basically flip to their opposite. So where, crime, where aggression couldn't be a crime, aggression now becomes a crime. Where sanctions were prohibited, sanctions become permitted. Where it used to be the case that government diplomacy was fine. Uh, now, coerced agreements are clearly prohibited. They're not enforceable. And where conquest used to be perfectly legal and legitimate, now it's illegal. But that didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen immediately. It took about 20 years to sort that out. And one of the big mistakes they made was not really thinking that through, though they can't be faulted for it, I think, because it's hard to anticipate how transformative this move was going to be. But it really did take um, two decades and unfortunately a world war to um, give us the system that we have. So now I'm gonna lay out a little bit of kind of how these each of these four corners kind of came into being um, and how they clearly rested on this idea that the prohibition on force was an essential shift um, that led to requiring these rules to flip and the kind of realization that that was necessary. So not long after the treaty is signed um, in, uh, in Paris and Japan is in fact among the nations invited to the, the very fancy signing ceremony, which is a great honor. Um, uh, Japan breaks the treaty by invading Manchuria. Um, it has a, a claim that Chinese brigands had set a charge on Japanese owned South Manchuria railway that runs through Manchuria. And that that was the reason that they had to protect the railway then to protect the railway, they had to basically invade all of Manchuria, but no one really buys it. Um, and again, we, we tell the full story of that, um, but, but essentially the, the UN sends a commission to try and investigate and essentially decides, you know, Japan really has violated its obligations here. It doesn't, it's not clear that in fact there was, were Chinese brigands who set this charge. Later it becomes clear in fact it was young Japanese soldiers who set the charge on their own railway to give them an excuse to go to war. Um, and Japan marches out of the League of Nations never to return. Um, but the world still faces a question, which is how are you going to enforce, enforce the law against war when the rules used to rely on war to enforce the rules? Um, so if the rules now say that war is illegal, how do you enforce the rule against war if you can't use war to enforce that rule? Um, they hadn't kind of amazingly really anticipated or at least um, uh, thought through and incorporated into the treaty an answer to that question. And so they're sort of in a conundrum trying to figure out how to resolve that question. Um, and the solution they, they, they land on um, is articulated in a note that's written by Secretary of State Henry Stimson to both Japan and China in 1932. And he basically says, the United States is not going to recognize any situation, treaty or agreement, which may be brought about by means contrary to the covenants and obligations of the Pact of Paris. Just as a side note, this was the moment that I, that I realized the Kelly-Briand Pact might be interesting um, because I was trying to figure out when it was that economic sanctions started and ultimately came back to this moment and this message and I was, and I wondered, what is this thing, this Pact of Paris? I've never heard of this before. Um, and a little bit of research uh, told me that the Pact of Paris was the Kelly Brand Pact, which I'd always heard was an absurdity and totally ridiculous, and you know, meant nothing. Um, and so this was intriguing to me: the idea that Stimson, in this very famous move to non-recognition, um, cites the Pact of Paris as the legal source of the justification for that move is, is really interesting and important. And, and for me in writing this book, that was a kind of aha moment that led me to become really interested in what might be happening here and how might the Kelly Brand Pact, which I had long thought 
to be totally ineffectual? Could it actually have been something more than that? Um, and so here, this is really the first time that a country says it refuses to recognize a conquest. It refuses to recognize, in this case, Japan to try and get around it, sets up a puppet regime, Manchuko, but all the nations kind of realize that's just a smoke screen. They refuse to recognize that this belongs to J Japan. They refuse to recognize that it belongs to Manchuko. The League of Nations follows suit. And so this is one of the rare instances, first instance really that we're able to find where a conquest is rejected as legal and legitimate. Um, there may have been other instances where it was derided and um, you know, met with dismay, but this is an instance where they just said, we're not gonna recognize it. We fail, refuse to accept that this territory belongs to you. And so where there had been a long recognized right of conquest by states, uh, that now is replaced by uh, the opposite, that is the prohibition on conquest or no right of conquest. And in fact, we did, um, we examined all the territorial um, transfers between countries from 1816 to the present using a beginning with a database, a Correlates of War database, but um, augmenting it with our own research. And what we found is that this was not just the kind of on the books um, and ignored in practice, but that in fact, this had a massive um, effect on state practice over time. Uh, that under the old world order, that on average there were over 200,000 square kilometers conquered a year by states. And in the new world order uh, that came into being, there are only about 15,000 square kilometers conquered a year. So conquest doesn't completely disappear. I'm gonna talk briefly about Crimea, for instance, which is um, an instance in the modern era of a conquest um, that has taken place. But so it's not completely eradicated, but it is now the exception rather than the rule that it used to be. And by sticky conquest, I mean that territory is taken and stays with the state that took it. Um, so World War II, a lot of territory was taken by Germany, but that was all um, taken away um, after the war. And so it didn't retain control over that territory. Okay. So um, notice also that that note that I mentioned um, also says it won't recognize any treaty or agreement which could be brought about me by means contrary to the covenants and obligations of the Pact of Paris. So this is a rejection for the first time of gunboat diplomacy. The idea that you can't, if you can't wage war and take territory, you also can't wage war and force a treaty that gives you control over that territory or control um, that you otherwise wouldn't have um, access to. And then that gets reaffirmed in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 52, a treaty which says a treaty is void and this still is controlling today. A treaty is void if its conclusion has been procured by the threat or use of force. And the commentary by Hirsch Latterpacht, who was a British um, uh, academic um, and lawyer at the time who wrote the commentary for the convention, he was working with the International Law Commission, um, explained that this was due to the pacts um, outlawry of war, the fact that it made war illegal, then meant that if war is illegal, then you can't threat, threaten war, engage in war to obtain treaties that then are enforceable. So that was an important shift. And it was recognized as a big shift because many of the states that had been subject to forced treaties wanted this to be retroactive um, so the Japans of the world wanted to say those treaties that we entered into at the point of a gun, we should be able to get out of those. And there was a question as to whether it was only gonna be prospective or retro retroactive as well. And the decision was made because the big guys, US, UK, France, et cetera, insisted on it only being forward acting because honestly it would have undone much of the international legal order at the time if it had been retrospective, given how prevalent gunboat diplomacy had been to that time. So where gunboat diplomacy had been perfectly legal and legitimate under the old world order, now gunboat diplomacy was no longer permitted. Um, now, um, neutrality. So neutrality also um, begins to change. Um, and here, um, just one, inst one example of this is Jackson um, is, has been asked to make a decision about whether the US can um, support Britain through the Lend-Lease program. And the Lend-Lease program during World War II, tradition, that would have violated neutrality. Traditional neutrality is understood under the old world order because you're certainly not offering those same terms to Germany. Um, so how can we justify it? 
And here Jackson says the Treaty for Renunciation of War was is yet another name for the Kellogg Briand Pact uh, by altering fundamentally the place of war in international law has affected parallel change in the law and status of neutrality. And that allowed the US to engage in this discriminatory favorable um, practices towards, um, towards uh, the UK and allies. So where neutrality used to require impartiality now allows partiality and economic sanctions are permitted. Okay, then what about um, uh, the crime of aggression? Um, so you all probably recognize this image. This is the image of um, the Nuremberg court um, and one of the big questions was, could the Nazis be tried for the crime of aggression after World War II? A after all, after World War I, they um, had determined that they couldn't try the Kaiser. So the question was um, put to those who are putting together the indictment. And they said, no, it is possible because unlike in World War I, we actually have a legal commitment here that has been violated. The, the legal commitment that has been violated that didn't exist in World War I is that these invasions were specifically planned in advance in violation of the terms of the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, which the US was party to, which all of the allies were party to, and which Germany, Japan, and all of the other countries that had been involved in the war were party to. So they could in fact be held liable for their actions. They could be criminally prosecuted for their acts. So where there had been a license to kill, that is no crime of aggression, now aggression is a crime. Um, it can be criminally prosecuted. Um, uh, and at least there's a possibility of, of prosecuting as a crime, which had not been true before. So the new world order replaces the, the permission to use force with a prohibition on force and all the rest of the rules have to change to fit. Okay, so now what does that give us today? And then I wanna, after that, I'm gonna say a bit about where we are um, in this moment and whether we're on the cusp of yet another transformation like the one we saw in the 1928 period. Um, so you might be saying, okay, that's all well and good. The Keller Briand Pact you know, made, made these changes, but that's all kind of in the past. That doesn't matter much. But what I think that fails to appreciate is the Keller Briand Pact in many ways is the precursor to the UN Charter or at least to a central commitment of the UN Charter, which is the prohibition on the use of force. And this image that you have here is an image that I found in the archives that um, it turns out to be the first draft of the UN Charter. This was a proposal that was made within the State Department. There was a process going on within the State Department during the war of what are we going to do after this war to create a new international organization. It was clear the League of Nations had completely collapsed and failed, that that was not going to be resuscitated. The US, of course, had not joined it. And, the, and they were already thinking in 42 what's gonna happen when this war is over? How are we going to keep the peace? How are we gonna stop this from happening yet again? And a proposal was put together by um, a, a committee. Um, and this is a first draft of one of, the, one of the drafts of what would become the charter. And you can see it's prepared by JTS. That's, um, it turns out James Thomas Shotwell, who is uh, the guy um, that I mentioned briefly prepared a draft of the Kellogg-Briand Pact for Briand um, to propose to Kellogg. So the same guy basically ghost wrote the Kellogg-Briand Pact and also wrote the first rough draft of what would become the UN Charter. And the Charter doesn't use the same phrasing as the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but it keeps that central commitment to a prohibition on force. It says all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. And it has very limited exceptions to that. That is Security Council authorization, self-defense, um, which is specifically permitted under Article 51. And um, it's understood that states can consent to outside intervention in their um, countries to assist them, for instance, in fighting, um, say now um, ISIS or other terrorist acts. So today we face a lot of challenges um, and uh, certainly all is not, um, not uh, uh, quite so simple as sort of this is a happy ending to the story. Um, it, obviously one of them is from ISIS. These are images of various members of ISIS um, and it's, it's motivated by an ideology that sees war with the West as really a driving force and rejects the whole idea of sovereign states and sovereign control over territory much of the fundamental um, 
founding ideals of the modern international order. Um, but it's not the only, it's not the only threat. Um, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea in clear violation of international law. These are the quote unquote little green men, um, the Russian soldiers that were sent in without insignia um, to assist in the takeover of Crimea from Ukraine and then it's joined, uh, it's joining into Russia. That is the first successful conquest in Europe since World War II and a really dangerous and troubling precedent um, for uh, the current world order and the status of the world order. Um, and China has meanwhile been engaging in a building spree in the South China Sea. It's laid claim to a huge number of islands, rocks um, and various other uh, underwater uh, items. Um, and it has been building major military installations on them. It's ignored an international arbitral decision against it um, and continued building um, and in clear violation of the prohibition on conquest um, and has refused uh, to listen to efforts to try and mediate that dispute, including again by the Law of the Sea Convention um, and the arbitral panel set up pursuant to that, which China is party to the convention, but it refused to recognize the the um, jurisdiction of the arbitral body. And, um, you know, Donald Trump obviously won the presidency on an anti-internationalist platform and he made good on a lot of those promises. Um, uh, his national security advisor, John Bolton, really waged a war on the International Criminal Court, um, claimed that it was a major threat to US national sovereignty. Um, and while he gave the speech in 2018, many of us thought, well, these are sort of empty promises, he's never gonna actually do that. Um, that has been, these claims have been followed by personal sanctions on the ICC prosecutor and her staff. Um, uh, really the first time international sanctions, which typically reserve for major international criminals, violators of international law, terrorists, has been used against the ICC prosecutor, which as a result of that can't actually do her job and come to the US to report to the UN, um, which of course the UN is located in New York. So a really unprecedented um, attack on international on the international order. Um, and Trump disregarded the Char Charter's prohibition on the use of force um, in a few ways, but notably one in April 2018, where it was joined by the UK and France, carried out military strikes um, in Syria um, against government forces um, in response to chemical attacks against civilians. Um, the UK is the only one that sort of articulated a principle of a claim of humanitarian intervention. The US never made any arguments along those lines, nor did France really. Even the UK accepts that that's not generally accepted as a matter of, of international law. Um, and in January 2020, Trump carried out a strike um, on Qasem Soleimani in Iraq. And uh, it also uh, seems that um, may have known about, though probably wasn't directly involved in the recent killing of the Iranian uh, nuclear scientist um, in Iran. So some pretty clear violations, the prohibition of use of force. Uh, the US has also recognized uh, the um, seizure of the Golan Heights um, and its control by Israel, despite the fact that um, it remains disputed territory and not recognized part of Israel remains part of Syria. And again, a kind of troubling erosion of the prohibition on conquest and the norm that you can't simply gain control over territory through asserting force. And Trump has withdrawn from a huge number of international treaties. Um, so this is a, a list of all of the treaties that he's withdrawn from, just an unprecedented number of pulling away from international commitments. Um, from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with the P5 and 1 um, that has led to the restarting of the Iranian um, nuclear program, even the Human Rights Council, you can read them all. Um, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was a really troubling withdrawal, has threatened to withdraw from the World Health Organization. As I'll mention in a moment, uh, President-elect Biden is certain to, to reverse that. And then it's withdrawn from a number of, of Article II treaties. Those are treaties made through the US constitutional process, which requires approval of two thirds of the US Senate, which is a nearly impossible bar to reach. And yet the president has withdrawn from five of those, which is pretty unprecedented without any approval from Congress, without even any consultation with Congress. And in the case of the Treaty on Open Skies, Congress actually explicitly made clear it did not want the president to withdraw from that agreement. And nonetheless, um, Trump announced withdrawal from it um, despite that. 
Now, the question is, how does the election change all that? Um, uh, does that, do, is there a reversal? Is, is America back again to try and defend the global order that it played some significant role in helping to create? Um, certainly many hope that that's the case. Biden has pledged to undo the America first foreign policy and return the US to a world stage to defend the international global order um, and you know, retake the US role as a, as a central player in construction as opposed to destruction of the global order. Um, he's appointed a number of top, or he's nominated a number of, of top uh, officials who are internationalists in the traditional sense. They believe in international diplomacy. They believe in working with our international partners. They are um, old hands at um, international negotiations. Um, and he's even created a, a new position, the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate at the cabinet level, which is a really important statement of commitment to trying to do something about climate change. So the signals are good um, that there's a kind of desire to reinvest in the international order. And here's a list of things, I'm not gonna read all of them, um, that I think we can expect from a Biden administration. I think, you know, certainly there's gonna be a change in rhetoric. There's gonna be a rejoining in of a number of treaties. There's gonna be much clearer and um, explicit support for the EU and NATO and much more direct engagement with the EU. A lot less enthusiasm for Brexit <laughs> than Trump had um, and support for it. Um, much more willingness to press back against Russian aggression and efforts to destabilize democracies. Um, as I said, a, a bigger emphasis on climate change is signaled by the appointment of John Kerry as a special envoy on climate change, a really unprecedented move, creating a kind of institutional structure for creating some, uh, some movement in that space. Policy on use of force is a lot less clear. We don't really know whether uh, a President Biden is going to be all that different from President Trump uh, on use of force policies. Um, we don't know who the Secretary of Defense is going to be. There's been uh, apparently a lot of different candidates under consideration. Um, and uh, so we don't know um, where that's going to go, whether it's gonna simply go back to Obama era policies which were not that different from the Trump era policies or whether they're prepared to, to really think about being more um, withdrawing a bit more from military operations abroad, particularly in the Middle East. Um, probably won't reverse the recognition of the Golan Heights. He opposed that and the moving uh, the embassy to Jerusalem, but it's made clear he's not going to, um, he's not going to reverse it now that it's done. But there's also limits to what Biden can do um, with the Senate and Republican hands. Um, there's a limited ability to rejoin international agreements or require congressional consent. Um, he's gonna be very limited in what he can do on climate change without the Senate, um, just because you can't do make significant moves without legislation and legislation will be difficult without control of the Senate and McConnell continues to control the Senate, he not only has more votes, but he also controls the agenda and can control what comes to the floor. And that could make it quite difficult um, for significant change to happen. Um, and it also seems highly unlikely that there will be a significant change to the domestic law on use of force, um, though it's possible that might be a priority, but that seems unlikely that they're gonna spend the limited um, effort that they have on that. So, so it's less clear what, what we're going to see What's the future of the international order and are we on the cusp of another transformation of the kind the internationalist documents? Had Trump been reelected, I would have said, yes, I think we are. Um, I think that we've seen enough erosion of the modern international order that was put in place um, after World War II, the world order that the internationalists created and a willingness of the US to abandon the central principles of that international order and meanwhile, you're seeing many of the key members of the Security Council, as I mentioned, Russia um, and China, uh, also turning their backs on some of the key commitments of the New World Order, prohibition on force, the prohibition on conquest in particular. Um, is uh, the election of Biden enough to halt that slide, change that transformation, or move it in a different direction? Um, it's less clear. I do think we are seeing 
a gradual, such an erosion of the central principles of the international order that I worry that the current system is not sustainable without much more significant investment um, by the international community as a whole in the world order. There's perhaps some possibility that the recognition the US is no longer going to be able to be counted on to play the central role in maintaining the legal order will lead other states to take a more significant role in playing that and assisting it and playing a role in maintaining those rules. But it also could lead to a free for all. Some of the big questions are what role is China going to play in this? It's been a spoiler in the South China Sea um, and has been kind of unwilling to play by the rules there. On the other hand, it's beginning to have the capacity to really shift and change the international order and play a much bigger role in setting the rules of the system. And it may actually be willing to play less of a spoiler role and play more of a role of a state that wants to maintain the system. Um, so there's a lot still to be seen. I think the next 10 to 15 years are really going to let us know better whether we're seeing the end of an era. Um, and, and I don't know what's going to replace it. We may be in for, if we are seeing the end of the new world order that the internationalists helped create, we may be in for a period of instability much like we had after the Keller Brand Pact where we had a decisive end of an era, but we didn't have the beginning. We didn't have clarity about what the new rules we're going to look like. We might be sliding back to rules that look a lot like the old world order where we're gonna start seeing more conquests. We might see more things that look like gunboat diplomacy. Um, we might see some of those rules creeping back in. Um, or we might see states realize that that's a really dangerous thing to have happen um, in a world particularly where there are nuclear weapons and very powerful, um, very powerful military machinery that didn't exist at the time that, this, that the old world order existed. And we might see a willingness to really press forward and trying to ensure that those that that decline doesn't take place. So we shall see. Um, I think the lesson of the book, um, which is really about these individuals who helped create this international system does offer some reason for hope. Um, and it's a call for action. It suggests that ideas do matter and individuals do matter. And it's not just something that's foreordained. Um, that it, you know, that simply happens um, and it's out of the control of everyone. No, each generation has to work to understand and maintain and renew and improve the world order and it's really up to us. So with that, um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Anna. That was a real uh, tour de force and a, a pleasure to listen. And we already have the first uh, questions uh, coming in. Uh, so I think that I'll sort of perhaps start with a was I suppose more of a comment and a question. And we usually do not uh, mention the names of the questioners, but I hope that uh, Judge Linzard will forgive me. I think it's just such a pleasure to have such a lustrous audience asking questions. She notes uh, whether it might have been good to mention Berta van Suttner as a strong anti-war activist, then I suppose a broader point about the female role and female voices often uh, dropping off the history in general and international law in particular. That is such an important point. You're absolutely right about that. And, and in fact, what's so interesting about this movement is that it's, it's, there's this idea that, um, that uh, Levinson and Shotwell are, um, are developing and kind of trying to sell. But the people who are doing the hard organizing work are the women's organizations, the anti-war activists, um, on the ground all around the world. And they are holding rallies, they are organizing women everywhere to oppose war. Um, of course, this is all happening during World War I, but particularly after World War I and the interwar period, the women's um, peace organizations are incredibly active. And really, in some ways, Levinson and Shotwell and the other men who are kind of trying to come up with political solutions are kind of riding on their coattails um, because they are doing the hard work of creating the underlying political support for this movement. And that makes it almost impossible for Briand to reject the idea that's brought to him to try and su su suggest a peace agreement with, uh, with the United States. And then Kellogg is completely boxed in because it's reported in the New York Times that, um, that this proposal has been made by Briand and politically it's impossible for him to, 
reject it because precisely because these women's um, movements have been so successful in rallying support among individuals. What's so interesting is, is how the women's uh, anti-war groups played a key role in sort of mobilizing public sentiment in favor of outlawing war. And there was massive support for this idea, but also how these NGOs, you know, they're, they're like sending postcards around They really, they're trying to reach out to everyone they can. There was a real, it, before the internet <laughs> and before direct mail, there was a version of direct mail they were sending out. They actually had Kelly Brand uh, agreement on little postcards that um, that were sent all around all around the world. So you're absolutely right to mention this, and 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 you're also right to mention that women sometimes get mi missed in the story. And I think part of the reason for that here is also that when you get to the level of diplomacy, women are really um, are are kind of shunted out of the picture, even though they're the ones who've done the really hard organizing work um, that makes it possible. So thank you for that question. It's a really good point. So we have a number of very interesting questions coming in. I think I'll try perhaps just sort of to generally kind of start with a bigger picture and then go to the smaller ones. Uh, so I thought that you finished with uh, a fascinating point, perhaps in the more skeptical reading of the arch of history that it is bending in a slightly unpleasant direction. What rules would you see sort of unwinding? Uh, are we looking at the old world order coming back? And I think that uh, the way how I read your argument, it seems that there were some things that you sort of saw coming like conquest. And I would be interested to, to, to hear what you think about neutrality. Or are we looking forward to a totally new combination of uh, rules and institutions? Yeah. So I, I worry about this um, a lot. Um, and, um, and I think it's not just whether the rules are broken, but what is the response when the rules are broken, right? So, so all rules are broken, you know? So, so like just because, uh, you know, there are murders still happening in the United States doesn't mean that the laws against murder are ineffective. ineffective. Um, there are still laws and they're effective, but they don't prevent every murder, they just prevent some number of them. Um, and so the mere fact that there are violations of these rules doesn't necessarily mean that the system is entirely broken. Um, and in fact, the, the seizure of Crimea by Russia can be seen as a positive story in the sense that it was a clear break with the rules of the international order, but states came out immediately in opposition. Every state called it what it was, which was an illegal act by Russia. Every state said it was a clear violation of Article 2.4 and states put in place pretty strong sanctions against Russia in retaliation in response to the illegal seizure of Crimea. Now that hasn't been effective yet. Um, will it be effective? We'll see. And Russia um, obviously is still holding Crimea and doesn't show any signs of giving it up, but it hasn't been all that long. That was 2014, it's 2020 now, um, and that could change. Um, but I think what worries me is when states break the rules and there's a big shrug. Um, that's what worries me. So when the US kills Qasem Soleimani in Iraq and there's a bit of a shrug, that worries me. Um, when, uh, when the US, UK and France use military force for, for what are understandable reasons, I mean, in retaliation for like horrific chemical weapons attacks on civilians, but um, no one bothers to try and articulate a legal rationale except for the UK and it articulates a rationale that's not widely accepted and there's a collective shrug. That's what worries me. Um, and, and what we need to have is states defending the idea that the prohibition on use of force is indeed a central underlying rule of the system because if they don't, then we begin seeing the rest of the dominoes begin to fall. And that's why I worry when we see the Golan Heights and we see uh, South China Sea and we see these things happening repeatedly, it's a sign that things may be eroding and beginning to fall apart. Um, and when we start seeing that, then we have to worry that the system is in fact unraveling. I don't think we're there yet, but the question is when are we there? Um, and every generation has to reinvest in this, this set of rules. And part of what this book is trying to do is say, look, this, this peaceful system we've been in for the last 70 years is not a foregone conclusion. Like it's not perfect. We recognize that there's lots of really, you know, 
bad situations around the world, but it could be so much worse <laughs> than it is. And we need to recognize that it, we've kind of forgotten that because most of those, most of us were not alive in that um, pre-World War II era, or at least not, not uh, adults are in the pre-World War II era. Um, and so it's easy for us to forget the rules haven't always been what they are today, but we need to recognize that they could be very different and we could be in a world where conquest is suddenly legitimized. Um, and then that's a very dangerous world indeed. Um, I just have one follow up question and then we'll go back. So I, I, I mean, the um, Russia, Crimea and reactions have strike me as a fascinating case study. And I think you are right if, we, if you will if you view law as a normative order, it will necessarily require things that will not automatically happen factually. Uh, and that uh, brings me to the point where, uh, uh, if I may be very forward, I think that your argument may be relatively weakest. And I guess that goes to the sanctions neutrality point, because I think on, other, on all the sort of other points, whatever the factual and compliance is as a matter of legal proposition, the prohibition of forcible reprisals, the uh, duress as a ground for termination of treaties, that is positive law. Uh, and I think that there is much greater disagreement outside the institutional framework regarding reactions to breaches, even of peremptory rules and the 2001 ILC articles are famously open on the question whether there are uh, countermeasures that non-injured states might take. And indeed, Russia and China in their mutual statement on the principles of international law, and very recently, Russia and Iran have really spoken out very strongly against the idea that there may be unilateral coercive measures, as they would put it, outside the institutional framework. How does that, I, I, it seems to me that that is sort of the one element of the four-partite modern law, modern order, which is challenged, which is less stable than the other three. Yeah, it's so interesting you raise that point. And I think those are all really important points. I mean, part of what's so interesting about this to me is that even um, now those rules are still being worked out. Um, and they're, they're, they're far less settled than the others, I think you're, you're right to point out. So the idea of countermeasures is pretty clear. States can countermeasure if they are themselves wronged, right? Under the draft articles, if you're wronged, you have a right of, if there's an internationally wrongful act, you have a right to countermeasure and response and doesn't necessarily have to be in kind, though that's preferred because that's e easier to make it proportional. And, and individual treaties also build into them various kinds of countermeasures. And we detail that, we call it outcasting. Um, and we have a chapter on outcasting and, and we have a separate article if any um, academics are on this webinar and interested in reading an article that really works this through in a more academic way um, called outcasting. Um, but what I found really fascinating is how even um, you know, as we were writing, innovations were happening and debates were happening about what the scope is of permissible sanctions. So one innovation that takes place is sort of by happenstance, the US um, happens on this idea of secondary sanctions. Um, and so it happens on this idea that it can sanction Iran and say anyone who does business with Iran can't do business with US banks. And if you say that, you basically freeze Iran out of the international community and global economy because the, with, because the dollar is the reserve currency of choice. That is a huge sledgehammer um, to use. Now, part of what I find so troubling about the Trump administration is it then that, that brought under the Obama administration, that technique brought Iran to the table, to the negotiating table. And we got the JCPOA in part because of that. But then the Trump administration snapped back sanctions and used that sledgehammer in totally illegitimate ways um, and ways that I think um, really undermine the legitimacy of the idea of economic sanctions. And then obviously using economic sanctions against the ICC prosecutor is yet another deep problem. So, so there's innovation happening, but, con but ongoing contestation about the proper scope of economic sanctions. Part of what I find fascinating is that there was an effort to make it more effective and more targeted to address many of the critiques more on a policy rather than legal level of sanctions, a concern that economic sanctions were responsible for really immiserating 
um, civilian populations and leading to death of children and being you know, the most vulnerable within the population. Meanwhile, you know, the leaders are running around in Rolls Royces and drinking vodka and, you know, and like not at all troubled. Um, and so that the, the new techniques of much more targeted individualized sanctions is also you know, a modern innovation, the capacity to actually track and designate individuals. But you're right that that remains contested. And, but what I think is important to recognize and what we think, what we argue in this book is you need some way to enforce the law. If you don't have war, you need something. If you don't have force, you need something. And outcasting, what we call outcasting, might be called countermeasures or sanctions, is an alternative and can be a really effective and much more legitimate one. But its legitimacy can also be undermined. And I didn't mention this in talking about Trump administration, but again, one of the things that really is troubling is a way in which I think there were actions taken that really delegitimized those efforts. Um, and so I think that I would love to see a conversation devoted to how do we make those really effective and legitimate um, and much more coordinated than has been the case. And we haven't really seen that full conversation take place in the way that it should. Uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And, and you're very right to point to 2001 ILC articles where even on countermeasures, there are actually provisions and provisions with conditions and conditions while on the third party or you know secondary sanction type countermeasures, there's very little at all. I think before we move on, it's worth noting that there are two pending ICJ cases brought by Iran, which may perhaps at some point throw some light on these matters. Yeah. Uh, so uh, two Two different questions, but I think perhaps sort of in some sense, uh, they may be uh, perhaps speaking a little bit to each other. One question relates to humanitarian intervention, sort of and the way how it uh, fits within the uh, new world order. So are they, as it were, cutting against the grain or are they contributing more generally to prevention of atrocities? And the other one, which is, by a separate, uh, separate listener, but I wonder whether in some ways maybe touching on, on somewhat analogous themes is a question about democracy and so the role of uh, spread of democracies uh, as perhaps as another proxy for thinking about the changes of the legal order. So humanitarian intervention on the one hand and sort of the rise of democracies, well, with a question mark, I suppose, nowadays yeah. on the other. Yeah. So um, on humanitarian intervention, um, my view may not be perfectly popular on this, but um, my view is that um, humanitarian intervention um, uh, is permissible um, and in fact, um, ideally done through um, authorization of the Security Council. So the Security Council cleared, there was some debate at one point about whether humanitarian intervention could actually be authorized by the Security Council. It seems clear to me that it can, that that's a part of its function of securing international peace and security. But where I um, depart from the UK position is the idea that states can unilaterally decide to intervene um, for humanitarian purposes. And the reason for that is that um, who's to decide what the humanitarian purpose is. Um, so a state to unilaterally decide that it's intervening for humanitarian purposes, if states get to do that on their own um, and they're the only judges of whether they actually have a true humanitarian purpose, what's to stop Russia from intervening in Georgia to protect for humanitarian purposes to protect Russian, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, Russian nationals from uh, persecution? What's to stop any state from intervening and claiming a humanitarian purpose. And part of what led me to this view was looking at the history of humanitarian interventions and a lot of instances where states were claiming humanitarian intervention and their purposes were clearly quite different from a true humanitarian intent. Um, and I think that the international order hasn't yet come to that agreement. I mean, I think it could. It could pass a treaty permitting it, states could authorize humanitarian interventions into their own countries, they could consent to it. There's elements of that in the African uh, Union, which permits um, a, a agreement in advance to intervention in instances where there's humanitarian crises. Um, uh, so that's all permissible. And I wrote an article um, uh, uh, about consenting to humanitarian interventions ex ante. 
um, but I don't think it's permitted by the system as it is. And I think even though you think it's a good rule, you don't wanna be making up rules on your own as you go along where you have to remember that it's not just the US and UK that are gonna be using that rule to legitimize their interventions. It's gonna be Iran, it's gonna be China, it's gonna be Russia, it's gonna be a lot of other countries who are gonna similarly claim the right to unilaterally intervene for what they call humanitarian purposes. Um, and that's, I think, deeply problematic. The spread of democracy, I think, is a really important um, step because um, there's really a lot of really great work that suggests that democracies tend to be more committed to rule of law, um, both at home and abroad, um, and tend to be drivers of, of international law development and rule of law development. And that is part of the move towards greater legalization of the international legal order. Um, there's also a counterbalancing concern, which is, um, sometimes articulated as fear of giving away sovereignty. Um, this is certainly a debate in the UK, it's a debate in the US. We don't wanna enter into international agreements that do they tend to take away our sovereignty. So there is a little bit of that concern of a contest between democracy and international law. I don't tend to think of it as, as as much of a clash as many do because international law, generally speaking, doesn't have force with states unless they consent to it. You consent to it through a democratic process. Um, and you can always, almost always withdraw that consent if the democratic process determines that the international agreement, whatever it is, is no longer in the best interest of the state. Um, so I think on the whole, sped democracy has been quite good for the international order and also part of the driving force of the move towards international law. Although we have a chapter in the book where we also talk about the fact that there's a prohibition on conquest, which comes about as a result of the prohibition on use of force by states is at least partially responsible, we argue, for the proliferation of lots of states. Um, because at the time that this rule is put in place, there's somewhere around just north of 50 states. Um, we tell a story that they, when they were building the UN building and they were building the building, the room for the General Assembly, they said, well, how many more states do we need to make room for? And they said, oh, maybe like 30 or 40. You know, at the time there were about 60. Um, and now there are 196 members of the, of the UN. So it's, a, it's, a, it's expanded much more than anyone anticipated. Um, and, and I think that's in part because states no longer have to fear conquest. Um, and so um, sovereignty um, now gives you kind of perfect inviolability. We've had a huge proliferation, not just of democracies, but as states as a whole, the number of states has gone up rapidly and that's really transformed the world order as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me jump in with one more broader question and then come back to this. So I thought it was very interesting when you again were looking at the crystal ball and wondering what um, how China uh, might uh, shape the legal order. Uh, and I think one way of looking at it, and I, and I may have picked it up from Jose Alvarez, but I think sort of the type of argument that sees a great deal of consistency in attitude towards international organizations, in attitudes towards international dispute settlement. I think that that was Alvarez's point that strong courts for money, no courts for anything else, you know, mm -hmm. perfectly, uh, a perfectly satisfactory explanation for everything that US and China has done for the last uh, 40 years. And indeed in terms of the use of force, uh, I think that Chinese scholars would be pointing to the Bandung Conference and associate declarations and say that they have been very consistent on non-intervention, non-use of force, and you know, perhaps a you know, plausible claim, certainly more than some Western states. So perhaps there is a, some optimism that uh, even if United States does not, but perhaps even China will be consistent and in some important ways, even more with the grain of the new legal order well, that's the hope, right? I mean, that's the hope is that they begin to realize that given the role that they're coming into, um, when you're in the role of a leader within the international community, ideally what you want is rules that everybody will follow. Um, and you want to play a role in shaping those rules. And it has been um, much more active in participating in international institutions and helping to shape some of those rules. I mean, one of the reasons the US was so, um, uh, that Trump had this kind of reaction to the WHO was because China has played a significant role in funding and directing the WHO, which is generally speaking been quite a good thing. Um, 
uh, though, you know, whether it slowed the reaction of WHO to the pandemic or not is another question, but it has been playing more of a role in these international organizations, but it's been a little bit inconsistent, right? So on the one hand, you're absolutely right. It votes against these um, efforts to, to um, engage in intervention abroad, um, although it allowed the intervention in Libya to go forward. And I think was upset then that that seemed to overstep the bounds of the Security Council resolution that may have been part of the reason it opposes um, any intervention in Syria. But um, so it's, it's been very clear on that, but then it's, then it's, um, it's engaging in pretty clear violations of that rule through um, building on these uh, islands um, in the South China Sea. Now they have an argument for why they can see that as, as, as historically part of Chinese territory and they contest the idea that it is not part of their sovereign territory. So they have an argument that they would consider to be consistent, but I think there's some inconsistencies there. And I think the idea that you can have hard courts for money and not for anything else ignores the idea that hard courts for money eventually have to get into everything else. Um, you know, it's hard for them to avoid getting into the other things. So you see the, the WTO starting to have to get into process-based restrictions, you know, differences between how the things are built matter, you know, and um, so inevitably those courts are gonna have to start getting into those issues. Um, and so I think that that clash is gonna be inevitable. And you know, our hope, or my hope at least, is that China decides that it's in its best interest to support those institutions and build those institutions uh, rather than oppose and undermine those institutions. Um, but, uh, but it's not entirely clear where we're headed on that. Uh so I think that, that uh, brings me quite neatly into what I think would be the last question. Uh, and it is a question about the role of international institutions and international organizations. And I think I'll sort of, I'll just frame it very broadly and you can take sort of whichever direction you would like. But I think that one of the themes that I think I heard in your talk was that there seems to be a sort of a push me pull you dynamic between greater use of force by some actors or at least more apparently reckless use of force and a withdrawal from institutions then i suppose another bit perhaps that could provide an alternative explanation of the story that this is really less about rules as such but more about the creation of genuine multilateral institutions where state actors can identify and develop genuinely communitarian interests. So it's less about Kellogg Rian, sort of it's more about the League of Nations setting and uh, UN and strong regional organizations. And I guess it could also be the question about what is the future for international organizations? So it's kind of really yeah. shaping it very broadly, take whichever way you want. Absolutely. Well, so, I mean, the hopeful vision is a vision where, um, where the way in which the international order develops is through creation of communitarian, more and more of these kinds of communitarian institutions. And one question that we face is we've seen the US kind of under the Trump administration at least relinquish its leadership role in the world order is what's gonna replace that? Doesn't seem to be China's quite ready to do that though it's maybe playing a greater role, but could there be a greater role for, for states coming together around shared interests to create institutions and structures to pursue their joint interests. We see this a little bit with the development of the vaccine, the joint project to develop the vaccine. Um, that's a kind of effort to create a kind of joint um, international effort um, that pools resources to develop the vaccine and then divvy it up among nations according to population. That's a really powerful and important um, development. And, you know, what we hope is that that's the direction the international order is going to go, that you have the creation of joint, the, the insight of the outcasting regime, which we argue replaces the use of force as a way of enforcing international law, is that you create global institutions that are in the best interests of states. And then the way that you discipline states is by withdrawing the benefits of those institutions. And that losing access to the benefits of that institution is the punishment, not invasion, not seizure of territory. And that's a good world to live in if you actually, if it's well functioning. Um, what we've seen is a kind of states engaging in a lot of navel gazing lately. I think, you know, the United States has done a lot of that, UK a bit with Brexit, um, the refugee crisis that's come as a result of um, partially of Libya, partially of, of Syria has really, I think, short 
uh, uh, short change the ability to really think deeply about these questions and think about how do we build, we don't need one organization necessarily to handle all problems. We can do this through a lot of multifaceted organizations and they don't have to necessarily be run by the US. They can be run by a variety of states. The global order, the great thing about it is that every state has the capacity to play an important role in shaping that global order um, and creating institutions. And there's no reason uh, that states can't play a positive role in that going forward, regardless of whether they sit on the Security Council or not, whether the Security Council is being active um, and powerful in pursuing those goals. So that's the vision that I would like to see is more effort to try and solve problem, problems through global organizing and cooperative institutions among a number of states, not necessarily waiting around for the US, the UK and France to, to lead them, but, but forging ahead um, to try and solve problems. I think that that is a wonderful, inspiring pluralist message, which I think can really bring us back also to the first question that there are many actors who can contribute the classic great powers uh, perhaps less traditionally influential states and also private actors as grassroots activists participating within the domestic political process. I think going back to your point about democracy, so we can, as it were, all take part mm -hmm. and perhaps some will be written about in the second edition of the internationalists in a decade or so. Yes, exactly. Well, uh, Thank you very much. And I think that, that uh, we unfortunately, the thing that we lack is the ability to hear the applause of our many, many listeners. But uh, let me just applaud myself on their behalf. Many thanks. That was a real tour de force. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for taking your evening to spend it with us. Um, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and thanks for having me.